For over 75 years, Culligan Water of West Bend has taken pride in being the local water experts. We live here, we work here, and we dedicate our lives to addressing common water worries, like hardness and contaminants, to deliver better water at every tap. We provide the world's best water treatment and the industry's best service to you and your home. Contact Culligan Water of West Bend, your local water experts. Get started at $10 a month for the first three months. Visit CulliganWaterWestBend.com today. History as it happens, May 7, 2024. The elections of 1860 and 1864. Republicans in the MAGA movement are not the ones trying to undermine our democracy. We are the ones trying to save our democracy. Very simple. Trump is trying to steal history the same way he tried to steal the election. But he, we knew the truth because we saw it with our own eyes. So it wasn't like something, a story being told. It was on television repeatedly. We saw it with our own eyes. Let's have trial by combat. The peaceful transfer of power, the cornerstone of American democracy, seemed a highly abstract concept today. Pretty huge civil war going on all across America. Oh, sure, but we just try to stay out. What kind of American are you? If democracy is on the ballot today, you should have been around in 1860. Lincoln wins, the South secedes, and four years of civil war to save the Union and destroy slavery. All elections are important, but some are more important than others. That's next with Sean Wilentz and James Oakes as we report history as it happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. You don't have to be the most important to be important. I mean, the rating game isn't, isn't to me, what's, what's essential here. What's essential is just that these are revolutionary elections, if you want to put it that way. They were elections that are going to decide the fate of the Constitution, of the country, and everything else. There are very few elections that have that kind of impact. I mean, you could say 1932 has some of that. What matters is that how profoundly important these elections were. Say no more, we can get to that. Something revolutionary happened in 1860. 64, it was necessary to complete that revolution. If it had gone a different way, the revolution would have been forestalled and maybe never occurred at all. Went to the movies a couple weekends ago and saw Civil War, directed by Alex Garland. And it was better than I expected. The main characters were journalists, so I enjoyed that. Photojournalists trying to get to Washington to document the capture of the Capitol by a seceding army. Some combination of California and Texas. And the combat scenes were exhilarating, courtesy A24 Films. Given what's going on in our country today, many moviegoers may have expected the film to offer a commentary on our hyper-polarized, hyper-partisan national fever. But that is not what I took away from the movie. I mean, there was one chilling scene where actor Jesse Plemons plays a camo-wearing, gun-toting vigilante interrogating the reporters he's captured. Okay. What kind of American are you? You don't know? I won't spoil that scene for you, but a lot of Americans today can no longer recognize their countrymen. They see them not as neighbors with different points of view, but as some kind of internal enemy. What kind of American are you? But as I said, Alex Garland's Civil War had no politics. The cause of the war, who exactly is fighting whom, are unexplained. There's no backstory. And uh, this is speculation on my part. Maybe Garland couldn't come up with anything that would be convincing. So instead of portraying some far-fetched or silly crack-up of the country, he opted to show us what a civil war might sound like and look like and feel like. Oh, my God. Like, like why didn't I just tell him not to shoot They're them? They're probably going to kill them anyway. How do you know? He doesn't know, but that's besides the point. Once you start asking yourself those questions, you can't stop. So we don't ask. We record so other people ask. And I left the theater thinking, you know, our country doesn't really resemble the country I saw on the big screen, on the verge of or in a civil war. There is no issue or issues in real life today that would lead to, say, secession or massive violence between opposing armies. Still, we are told our democracy, the fate of the Constitution, may be on the ballot this November. Donald Trump gave two interviews just published in Time magazine where he talks about going after his political opponents and conducting mass deportations of illegal immigrants, including setting up detention camps, maybe, among other plans for a second term. 
But if you read the transcript of those interviews, Trump still comes across as someone who's not quite sure how government works or what he'd even have the authority to do. Then again, I don't recall any presidential candidate in my lifetime talking this way. And no president until Donald Trump rejected the peaceful transfer of power. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. So, as you know, I often say nothing is truly unprecedented in American politics. In 1860, democracy, the Constitution, were on the ballot. The future of the Republic was on the ballot. As seven southern states seceded after the victory of the first anti-slavery president in U.S. history, Abraham Lincoln. The southerners rejected the results of an election. But rather than try to overturn the election, they left the Union altogether to defend their peculiar institution, the new cornerstone of a slaveholder's republic. And in 1864, the future of slavery was on the ballot, as without Lincoln and the Republicans win that year, there would have been no 13th Amendment. This is the third episode in a monthly series about important elections. And these two, 1860 and 64, may be the most important of all, or in the top five, or whatever ranking we give them. Our country today is still shaped by the consequences of the Union victory in the Civil War and destruction of slavery in America. Historian Sean Wilentz is the author of The Rise of American Democracy. I've read all of his books, and this one is my favorite, published in 2005. Historian James Oakes is the author of Freedom National, The Destruction of Slavery in the United States, 1861-65, to published in 2013. I use both of these books to prepare for this episode, to inform my questions, and who better to ask than these two superb scholars. Sean Wilentz, welcome back. Great to be here, Martin. Jim Oakes, hello. Hey, Martin. How are you doing? Are these the two most important elections in U.S. history? Sean, why don't you go first? You don't have to be the most important to be important. I mean, the rating game isn't, isn't to me, what's, what's essential here. What's essential is just that these are revolutionary elections, if you want to put it that way. They were elections that are going to decide the fate of the Constitution, of the country, and everything else. There are very few elections that have that kind of impact. I mean, you could say 1932 has some of that. What matters is that how profoundly important these elections were. Say no more. We can get to that. I agree. I learned a long time ago never to say the word best about anything (laughs) because you get in trouble. Somebody will come back and say something, something, oh, what about so-and-so? But 60 and 64, they're interesting because the elections themselves play out in very, very different ways. In some ways, the issues are fundamentally different, and yet they're fundamentally connected to one another. You know, I start from, you know, the chapter in Jim McPherson's book on the election of 1860 is called The Revolution, Revolution. of 1860, right? right? And, and that's right. I think that's right. Something revolutionary happened in 1860. 64, it was necessary to complete that revolution. If it had gone a different way, the revolution would have been forestalled. And maybe never occurred at all. I sense you're referring to the anti-slavery revolution, but there was also a Confederate revolution, a pro-slavery revolution. Well, the counter-revolution. The next chapter is called the (laughs) counter-revolution of 1861. So that's Uh the secessionist. I pulled Battle Cry of Freedom off my shelf the other day uh, and perused it to prepare for this, but I have your books here. You know, I lift weights several times a week, but uh, this morning I didn't have to lift weights. I just picked up your books and uh, carry them uh, to the office. Well, you know, some elections are, as you just said, fascinating to discuss on their own, by which I mean it's not necessary to draw lessons or analogies or, you know, lines or through line from past to present, but we're living in an age right now, as you both are well aware, comparisons du jour. And well, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that democracy is having its issues today, whether democracy is on the ballot this coming November or the fate of our democracy is on the ballot. Any thoughts to add about excessive analogizing? Oh, yeah, it's it's something that historians, you know, are always warning against. Analogizing has a terrible effect because it domesticates things. It makes things seem, you know, safe because we've been it before. We have another example. And it takes away from the volatility, takes away from the danger. Very often that's the case. And I don't like it for that for that reason. Things are really, really bad or really, really good on their own terms. To compare to something else diminishes those things, I think, automatically. 
And it's where historians, I think, you know, it's a nice gig. You make, you know, you can go on TV and make some money doing it. But I find it very irresponsible for a present politics. It's bad history, too, but it's really bad for the present. Analogies are always imperfect at the best. They always distort, you know, and sometimes the distortion is really severe. The new Jim Crow yeah. <laughs> is a very right. bad analogy. Right, right, right. It's a very bad analogy that has taken hold in the political culture. And, you know, it's just the latest example of many such bad analogies. So I prefer not to use them as well. I do think there is something to learn from the 1850s uh, that might be applied to today. And that is just seeing your opponent as being, you know, beyond the pale. And then the cycle of polarization is amplified and information or disinformation or misinformation on each side. I mean, that was around in the 1850s, 1859, for instance, how the John Brown raid was portrayed in the North versus how it was portrayed in the South. The difference is that there really was a fundamental and serious issue at stake. And the difference of opinion in the North and the South about John Brown's raid reflected an irreconcilable conflict between the North and the South over the pro- how to deal with the problem of slavery, or even whether it was a problem. So that's the difference between then and now. But now the culture wars have thrown up an awful lot of dust and letting politicians off the hook to not deal with more fundamental issues, I think. And so, you know, yes, there's a lot of overheated rhetoric in the 1850s. It goes over the top a lot of times, but at base, something very serious and fundamental was being debated in a way that I think now we're avoiding. That was tariffs, right? Kidding. (laughs) So- uh, States rights, sir. Sean Wilentz, is it right to say that the only issue that truly mattered by the election of 1860, even before that, was slavery? Yes. That's not to say that other issues weren't there. I mean, they were. But, you know, in fact, it was the suppression of those old issues that allowed the Republican Party, for example, to exist. I mean, remember, there had been real divisions in the 1830s, the 1840s, even on to the 1850s, about things like the tariff and about things like the Bank of the United States. And politics was, you know, uh, should we say, um, structured around those differences, right? So in order to bring a new party together after 1854 in particular, early on, actually, you, you know, the Free Soil Party had all this stuff about post offices and all this stuff about the Democratic Party. They, they kind of did their best to be Democrats as well as anti-slavery. But by the time you get to the mid-1850s, that stuff is being suppressed. I mean, they're they're trying to create a coalition. And the South had always kind of been more united around those things anyway. And there were Whigs and there were Democrats, yes, true. But by the time you get to the 40s and on into the 50s, the degree of suppression you have to do in the South is minimal. In the North, it's a lot. And so that slavery becomes the issue not simply because it is the issue, but also because everything else has to be undone for political reasons. I think I might put it a little differently. I think those issues became connected in some fundamental okay, ways to slavery. Yes, yes. Right. So the South yes. is the opponent of homestead legislation, and the right. South is the opponent of tariffs. And the corruption issue, which is really quite significant oh, yeah, in 1860, yeah. is understood to be the corruption you know that's foisted under the Republic by the slave power, right? That's in right, order to right. keep the slave power in. So those issues are there. The corruption issue is really quite significant in 1860, and it's one of the reasons Lincoln got the nomination instead of Seward. It's just that it's so totally connected at that point to slavery. Again, the underlying issue is slavery. I think in some cases they're assimilators, as you say. That just speaks to the importance of the slavery issue, that it can, that everything else does fold into it. Sean, as you say on page 742 of The Rise of American Democracy, which is the most uh, referenced book in history as it happens 323 episodes or whatever I've done here. Uh, Nowhere else but there. (laughs) (laughs) You say here about the aftermath of the Lincoln-Douglas debate, so this is going a little bit back, uh, well, 1858. You say uh, the fact that the debates barely made mention of tariffs, banks, internal improvements, or anything other than slavery sustained Lincoln's basic contention that slavery was the one great issue that had divided the country and continued to divide it despite repeated assertions that the issue had been settled. Mm -hmm. So uh, I mentioned John Brown before, his influence on the election of 1860. David S. Reynolds wrote a book with this thesis that John Brown sparked the Civil War. 
Yeah, I reviewed that uh, book, and I, I didn't think it was true. I agree. Yeah, in your review, in Sean's review of that book, he says the most significant outcome of John Brown's raid might have been the fact that it scared Northerners away from more radical Republican yeah. candidates and got Lincoln the nomination. Yeah, it, it, it was getting exactly. Abraham, which is not John Brown's intention. Um, right. But, but it was his greatest contribution to anti-slavery and the American cause. No question about that. But the idea that, yeah, that John Brown sparked it because John Brown was into violence and there was a civil war, there was going to be violence. So therefore, he caused a civil war. I mean, this is insane. This is just special pleading, frankly. I mean, Peter Worsbicki, our my colleague, has written about this with great force that, you know, there were certain pockets of northern intellectuals and then beyond them as well who saw in, in John Brown some kind of messianic Oliver Cromwell-like figure coming out of the pages of history to, to redeem, you know, truth, justice in the American way or whatever you want to put it. Was it true that church bells tolled at the hour of his execution on December 2nd? There was a Brown enthusiasm to an extent in the North, but politically it was n not exactly good news for the Republicans, right? Because it was going to allow the South to say that they were revolutionaries, they were out to, you know, to kill white people. I mean, all of that stuff. Jim can go into it, but I mean, Seward actually kind of paid for John Brown a little bit, didn't he? I mean, didn't he? Yeah, I think so. The thing is, the Democrats in the North tried to tar the Republicans with the brush of John Brown, and that leads the Republicans to almost to a person to disavow John Brown's reign. So again, it's the fear of radicalism that contributed to Abraham Lincoln's victory in the Republican at the Republican convention, I think. You know, yeah. it's it's just difficult to say. It's not the only thing, but it's certainly no. yeah. it's certainly there. So here, I think, is really the more important cause of what we're going to be discussing here and the outcome of the election. Again, citing Sean's book, which I used to inform my questions for the first part of this podcast, and I have Jim's book for uh, 1864. It is not just that there was a debate over slavery. Right now, the Southerners, as you say here, Southern belligerents gravitated to two causes, and this is in 1859, reopening the African slave trade and enacting a federal slave code to guarantee slavery's protection in all national territories. You say here also that the South held out hope slavery could be vindicated without dissolving the Union. So the Southerners and the hardliners, they see what's potentially coming, and that would be the potential of a Republican winning the election in 1860. And they know what comes with that because, as Jim has argued, Republicans were trying to end slavery. Not immediately, but they were trying to put it on the path to uh, ultimate extinction, to borrow from Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So we see this legislation, attempts at legislation in the Congress by the South to try to protect slavery before it's too late, right? The demand for a federal slave code is a response not to the Republicans, but to the Northern Democrats. Mm -hmm. And what splits the Democratic Party is the unwillingness of the Douglas Democrats to accede to a plank calling for a federal slave code. Because it, if they supported that, they wiped out their entire alternative to the Republicans, which is popular sovereignty. And so I think that slave code plank is more important for understanding the crack up of the Democratic Party yeah. than for anything uh, mm -hmm. having to do with the Republicans. They're never going to support such a thing. You know, right. they're on the opposite end of the spectrum. They're saying Congress can't can't even allow slavery into the territories. But it's the Democrats they're going after. The Northern Democrats is what they're going after by pushing that plank. And that's crucial for understanding the election, because mm -hmm. if the Democrats hadn't cracked up in Charleston, there's a very it's a very slight chance that the Republicans would have won if they had managed to come out unified in a rickety union. Another thing to bear in mind, though, is that those two demands that you mentioned, the open reopening the slave trade and the federal slave code in the territories, is the culmination of pro-slavery constitutionalism going all the way back to 1787. I mean, these are the issues. These are the two issues, the slave trade and slavery in the territories. And around 1820 or so, it becomes very clear that the pro-slavery people are going to try to reinvent the Constitution in their own image, that they're going to say that the Constitution forbids the Congress from doing anything in the territories. Then, of course, Calhoun comes along and others and radicalizes that and turns it into they have a duty to protect slavery in the territories. But these are very, very old. And they go to the core of what the, the, the Civil War is really about. It, it is the completion of a revolution, but it's the completion of the American Revolution in some ways, that, right. that the issue 
issues that are raised at the Constitution and so forth around slavery, they develop, they get fought over. There's an anti-slavery constitutionalism that arises as well. But I think what you see at the end there, these are the issues that have always mattered, that, you know, fugitive slaves as well. That's, it's not the only ones, but they've always mattered. You know, they're reaching their culmination. Conflict is coming to a head. And Jim is right. This is really about a conflict within the Democratic Party, not just Democrats versus Republicans. You say here, Sean, the demand for a federal slave code arose directly out of Dred Scott, the decision, not the person, and Stephen Douglas's revision of the popular sovereignty idea, although it had long been implicit in Southern demands for equal access to the territories. I want to talk about the crack up of the Democratic Party. But first, I mentioned Hinton Helpers, the impending crisis. This is more of a, a symptom of uh, the divisions in the country than a cause. But apparently the 1859 House Speaker vote. So they got to elect a new Speaker of the House. And uh, anyone who was associated with this book that was uh, really critical, well, I'll, I'll let you guys pick it up from here. I've got a copy of Helper's book on the oh, you show. you do? <laughs> uh, an original first edition. Yeah. I'll find it sometime. Maybe say, yeah. er, early in the year, Republican publicist spearheaded by the old Jacksonian Francis Blair compiled a shortened, slightly toned-down version of oh, yeah. Helper's work and distributed by tens of thousands around the country. Yeah. Sixty Republican congressmen signed a circular endorsing the book. Yeah. So this caused an uproar in the House of Representatives, and they couldn't elect a speaker. That's yeah. how divisive this was. It's a, it's a warning about writing blurbs. You know, you can get in real trouble <laughs> if you write a blurb for a book. <laughs> you don't count exactly. on it. Exactly. Right? Um, yeah, well, okay. They were embarrassed. But- they were embarrassed. They were, yeah, I mean, go ahead. Take well, it away, Jim. They were embarrassed because they hadn't read it. And they, they <laughs> signed on to it. And they didn't know what they were signing on to. Yeah, and they just, exactly. you know, it's, right. it happens all the time. We see it all the time today. The thing is, speaker fights caused by the slavery issue go way back into the 1840s, just as Sean was saying before. That just happens to be, at that moment, the precipitating cause of the speaker fight, but the speaker fights over slavery are not well, new in 1859. Even in the 1820s. I mean, when Barbara yeah. replaces Taylor in 1822, right. is it? I mean, right. you know, it, it's been there from the start. Okay. I kind of feel about the helper brouhaha the way I feel about John Brown. If Helper's book had been published in 1829, and if John Brown had raided Harper's Ferry in 1829, it would have had a very different reaction. It's the context. It's by 1859. The politics of slavery are so inflamed that issues that in a different context would have flashed and gone didn't flash and go away. You know, they just contributed to this steamrolling into civil war that seemed to be happening. Sean, you write that the rhetoric on both sides in both the House and Senate became so vicious, James Hammond remarked, that only persons who do not have a revolver and a knife are those who have two revolvers. So it takes 44 (laughs) ballots. 44 ballots. Sherman withdraws in favor of a bland Republican New Jerseyan who had supported the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850 and whom the Upper South deemed safe enough. And, uh, you know, Professor Wilentz, you don't even mention the poor guy's name on this page here, uh, page 756. It's William Pennington of New Jersey. I think I was, he was, I was standing up for the state of New Jersey, I guess. Or <laughs> most short-lived uh, <laughs> Speaker of the House, I think, ever. I don't know. He, he may have lived a long time, but he wasn't yeah. the Speaker of a very long time. Or John Sherman. You know, he was he was hardly a radical. I was going to say. <laughs> he, was, he, was not the, uh, he was far from being the most radical member of the, the Republican yeah, right. Party. But he endorsed that so, book, so oh well. But he endorsed the book without having read it. <laughs> don't do blurbs, man. Just don't do them. As mentioned, the Southerners are advancing legislation that is highly uh, controversial, and they're putting immense, the Southern wing of the party is putting Democrats, immense pressure on the Northern wing to the point where they try to disrupt Stephen Douglas's attempt to get the nomination of his party for 1860. This seemed to be, well, counterproductive to say the least. Why did the Southern wing of the party act this way vis-a-vis Douglas? Well, they were reasserting their control of the party, for one thing. It's a long story about how this, the slave power takes over the, the Democratic Party. It was not true from the beginning. It, it was a process. It took some time. The fact was, you talk about context, what had happened in Kansas around the Lecompton Constitution, for example, had divided the Democratic Party already, or at least the Northern Democratic Party, between the, the president, James Buchanan, and Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas is not going to go along with the president's policies around Kansas, because he couldn't. <laughs> he, he had come up with this bogus idea of popular sovereignty as a kind of way to square the circle. He hadn't come up with it. It was older than that. But he picked up on it as a kind of way to square the circle constitutionally, politically, et cetera, et cetera, on the, on the territory issue. And once he picked that up and he 
fights for that very, very hard in, in 1858 against Lincoln, who exposes it for what it is. But nevertheless, he fights very hard for it. Now, another thing that happens, of course, is the Dred Scott decision comes along and basically declares popular sovereignty unconstitutional, saying that Congress has no power to do anything at all in the territories. Right. So he's under great pressure himself. What we're seeing is those things culminating in the Southerners, basically the slave power, basically saying, we run this show. They're not entirely sure that Lincoln's going to win. Some of them want Lincoln to win, but that's another whole story. <laughs> For many of these Southerners, the difference between Lincoln and Douglas is that Douglas comes to be viewed as a traitor. Yeah. Because his response to the Dred Scott decision is basically, they call it the Freeport Doctrine. If a territorial legislature chooses not to protect slavery, pass legislation protecting slavery, then no slavery will be there, which is which causes the the Southern Democrats to say, in that case, I want a federal slave code, right? But that for them is treason. You know, he has now gone over to the dark side. They hated the Republicans, but the treasonous character yeah, yeah. of Douglas made some of them say they would rather have Lincoln than Douglas. And they were that's what they were thinking going into Charleston. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the thinking. Popular yeah. sovereignty is the idea that local legislation is strong enough to push back against encroachments of the slave power. And Lincoln thought that that was a nonsense idea. It was a nonsense idea, yeah. which is what Kansas showed. And the party does split. I mean, there's talk today of the Republican Party splitting because you have the anti-Trumpers or the never-Trumpers versus the populists who support Trump and the party. But the party hasn't split. This was a real split. The Democrats meet first in Charleston, uh, and they're unable to agree on a nominee. So then they meet later in Baltimore, and the, the hardliners from the South pull out, and they hold their own nomination. So the party nominates two candidates— I often say that nothing is really unprecedented in American politics, but this seems like it's fairly unprecedented, Sean. Two candidates from the, the same party. The same party. Yeah, yeah. I can't think of off the top of my head. I can't think of something that's quite yeah. like, like And that, that was John Breckinridge in the South and Douglas yeah. in the North. It goes to everything that Jim was just talking about. It was personal. I mean, read the descriptions. There's a wonderful Cincinnati reporter. What was his name? Murat, I think his name was. I can't remember. Murat exactly. Helstead. Murat right, Halstead. That's it. Murat Halstead, who covered the conventions. And they published his reports at some point, not too long ago. And he describes the scene in Charleston and what it was like. And I mean, Charleston at that time of year is hot anyway. But imagine it in 1860, right, with, you know, horsepower and the smells and all the rest of it. And everybody's drinking like crazy. But the, the scenes of the Northerners walking the streets of Charleston, particularly the Douglasites, who were, as I recall, they were um, headquartered in Hibernian Hall, which still exists. You can kind of imagine it, actually, if you if you look down that part of Charleston. But it was it was mephitic. It was just going to strangle you. The tension around that, basically the looming violence that was behind everything, everywhere you looked. You're talking about Hammond and the Senate talking about two pistols or one pistol. What was going on in Charleston, the Civil War would have been fought within the Democratic Party uh, because of that scene. I mean, there have been bad conventions, God knows. I mean, Democratic Convention 1968 was no walk in the park, I remember, because I was there. Those are the only two that I conventions yeah. that I can imagine that were quite that fraught. Yeah, um, it virtually guarantees a Republican victory, doesn't it? Uh, because uh, a la 1912, when Teddy Roosevelt was denied the GOP nomination, he decides to run as a third party, splits the vote, and that's why Woodrow Wilson wins. Yeah. Yeah. People still worried a little, wondered a little bit about what New York was going to do. I mean, it was not an ice cold, simple thing. As soon as as soon as yeah, they split, course. that's it. But it certainly made it a lot easier. I do think that once it split, it was kind of inevitable that the Republicans were going to win. I, I mean, Breckinridge gets zero votes in the north. And, yes, yes. And Douglas gets like 12 percent of the votes in the south. And right. so, you know, and Lincoln gets no votes in the south. So right. the the split in the Democratic Party reflects the split in the country and it's regional. And if you want contingency, I'm not a big fan of contingency because when people do contingency in the Civil War, they usually go overboard. Had the president, the presiding president of that convention in Charleston, decided that all it took was two thirds of the members present then the convention would have nominated Douglas and that would have been the end of it, right? There would have been no movement to Baltimore and uh, probably those Southern bolters would have come back with their tails between their legs, angry. But, but you know, the, the whole thing could have been different. But he made this decision. There had to be a quorum or something. I forget yeah. how many people yeah, yeah, had yeah. to be there. And that meant that Douglas could not get the required votes 
to get the nomination by himself. The party had to split in order for Douglas to get the number of votes he needed, just as it had to split for Breckenridge to get the number of votes they need. They had to have two conventions yeah, in right. Baltimore. Right. The no thing is, a uh, Stephen Douglas was not anti-slavery. He just didn't want to go along yeah. with the more strident proposals of the Southern slave power that I alluded to before. And Jim, you're, you've always been hammering this with me in, in our conversations. Lincoln just doesn't win out of nowhere by accident. The Civil War just doesn't happen in 1860. There had been a conflict over slavery. And as Sean says here, to start 1860, the actual election year, Albert Gallatin Brown lays before the Senate resolutions calling for a territorial slave code to protect, quote, property recognized by the Constitution of the United States. Two weeks later, Jefferson Davis presents an even more elaborate set of proposals backing a slave code while also pronouncing all interference with slavery by any state government, as well as the federal government, a breach of the Constitution. The point here is the hardliners are going for broke. Yeah, uh, that second Davis resolution that you read was about fugitive slaves, I should say. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. A state that interferes with the rights. That's about northern states obstructing fugitive slave renditions. Mm-hmm. Right? The demand for a territorial slave code, that's the territorial issue. Those are the two big issues, I think, in 1860. You know, I think we underestimate the significance of the fugitive slave yeah. issue by focusing too much on the – I mean, the territorial issue is huge, but yeah. – yeah. And that too, by the way, as Sean said, that goes back to the 1780s. They're already disputing that in the 1780s. There's a fight over the Fugitive Slave Clause and the wording of the Fugitive Slave Clause at the Constitutional Convention. Mm -hmm. And northern and southern states were already fighting with one another over this, this issue. So that's also an old issue. It's also a key issue, and the key issue in even in the um, in Missouri in eighteen twenty, yeah, that's all about the territories. But one of the reasons that they that the Southerners demand what they do is they say that slavery is constitutional because of the Fugitive Slave Clause, and and because it, that's what makes slavery property. If slavery is property, therefore slavery cannot be undone by the Constitution. So you you know that was a rationale. It was a territorial issue that with the Southern position was based on a reinterpretation of the of the Fugitive Slave Clause, which nobody else had ever 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 held. So the two are actually com- entwined, I think, in many ways. And then when you get to the in 1861, I'm jumping ahead a few months, That's right. to the ordinances of secession, I mean, it's the fusion of slave question that really is foremost, I think, forefront, much more than the territorial issue. It's, it's really quite extra- extraordinary. So in retrospect, it would have been better for the Democrats had they not split, but there were reasons why they did split. But then when we come to the Republicans and their convention in Chicago, they don't nominate the quote-unquote more radical candidate, Seward, and they don't opt for some of the other major players in Republican Party politics, people who had won an election uh, more recently than, say, Abraham Lincoln, who hadn't won an election since 1846. They nominate the supposedly moderate Lincoln, who repeats ad nauseum, I'm not going to touch slavery where it already exists, that we have to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, even though I hate it. Uh, he doesn't say that. He says we have to enforce the Fugitive Slave Clause. 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 What did the question I is how they're going to do it. Oh, yeah. okay. The I act he doesn't like. Yeah, the act of 1850 was to put teeth into the clause in the Constitution. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. So but the larger point here, that... though, about Lincoln being the supposed moderate, and you know, what do the, the South have to really worry about? This guy keeps telling him, don't worry, I'm not going to mess with your institution where it exists. Why don't you start unpacking that, Jim? Every Republican said that they're not going to interfere with slavery in the states where it exists. That means they're not going to abolish slavery. They never do. Congress, at no point in the Civil War does Congress ever abolish slavery in a state. It can't. It doesn't. It just doesn't. So that doesn't make Lincoln any different from any other anti-slavery politician in the the North. He does have a reputation for being less radical than Seward. But, you know, I don't think he was any less radical than Seward. For example, to get the conservative Whigs and the nativists into the Republican Party, Seward was openly, aggressively welcoming of immigrants. He was good friends with Archbishop Hughes in New York, and he helped get the state legislature to fund public Catholic schools. He was openly, overtly anti-nativist. Lincoln hated the nativists, too, but he was quiet about it in his most... His most aggressive statements against nativism are in private letters. letters, He comes off as less radical 
in certain ways. But on these fundamental questions, the House divided speech is just as radical. He said, I don't believe in the in the higher law doctrine, but he believes in the same higher law doctrine that He's quoting the Declaration of Independence and the principle of those natural rights all the time, which is exactly the higher law doctrine that Seward was doing. So he comes off and appears to be more moderate than Seward, but he isn't any more moderate. And, you know, so the appearance matters, it seems. Historians give a lot of credit, correctly, to the brilliant work of Lincoln's strategists at the convention led by David Davis. But what they were doing was taking advantage of a stop Seward movement that was already there in the party and was pretty deeply entrenched. Lincoln's strategists and were able to take advantage of that and they did a brilliant job of taking advantage of it but they didn't turn a convention around that was mm. never going to go that way yeah. so sean how does adding to jim's point lincoln emerge from this crowded field if you will of course there were no primaries i mean it was the party leaders who decided right and then they put up to the ballots yeah, they were real conventions was- in those days yeah, they were real conventions. It was pretty much political small fry in comparison to, I mean, Edward Bates. Don't forget, by the time he got to, to 1860, Lincoln's got a national reputation. And he hadn't been elected since 1846. That's true. But he debated Stephen Douglas in 1858. And he was very, very sh- shrewd about getting the word out about Abraham Lincoln. He, he lost the election because of you know, gerrymandering, basically. But it doesn't matter. He made sure that the people were reading that. And another thing I have on my shelf, actually, is a copy of those debates from 1860. It became, it gave Lincoln a, a sectional, national reputation, but certainly a sectional reputation. I can't think of a, of a, of a one-term congressman uh, who had quite the reputation that Lincoln did by the time those debates were over with. Uh, and that's number one. That's important. The thing about Seward also, Seward started earlier on all this stuff. So the higher law speech is 1850 or so. He was already branded as a radical while Lincoln was still doing railroad stuff, you know, figuring out what was going on in Illinois. He's been making these very important speeches in Illinois, right, beginning in 1854, one in Peoria, and then there's the House Divided speech in 1858, and then there's the debates in 1858. These are major. and, And by the time you get to the late 1850s, by the way, these speeches actually are broadcast much more widely than they would have been, say, 10 years earlier, because, of, you know, you have the telegraph, you have newspapers and all the rest of it. So that Lincoln's name is actually a pretty big deal by the time you get to 1860. And then in February 1860, Lincoln does a very important thing, which is that he agrees to, he's originally going to give uh, the speech at Henry Ward Beecher's church in Brooklyn, the Church of the Holy Rifle, as they called it, for for support of, so he was going to kind of go in a radical enough direction, but just so far, they ended up switching it to the Cooper Institute, now known as Cooper Union. And so he gives his speech in February 1860. And in front of him is going to be the entire New York City Republican, New York State Republican establishment, right? And who is this gawky guy, you know, from Illinois? Yeah, he has this reputation, but he doesn't look very imposing. He's certainly not one of them. And he gives a speech in which he wins them over. He has a dissertation, like study of of Lincoln Douglas. Douglas had published a piece in Harper's Monthly, and Lincoln went, you know, just read it like crazy and gave a speech which hammered exactly, brilliantly, all of the issues that were before the Republicans right then. He talks about John Brown in a way that's very powerful. You know, he says, we believe in what John Brown believes in, except we don't believe in the way he went about doing it. You know, we're, we're very anti-slavery, but really this guy, no, no, no. He talks about popular sovereignty, dramatizes the issues that divide him from Douglas, and that's really the ball game. And then at the end, he has this peroration about right makes might, not might makes right, you know, all of that. Yeah. It's a brilliant performance. So, And then he goes up to New England and, and carries, you know, the momentum forward. So part of the emergence of Lincoln is Lincoln. I mean, he's a he's a brilliant politician, and he knows exactly what he's doing, and he does it extremely well. Never going too far overboard, but always making clear that he was there. He had he was at that side, but that he was competent. That he was you know that he could be a president. And the other thing he would say was that while he was in New York, he visited I think he visited Barnum's Museum, but he went to Matthew Brady's photographic uh, studio. And Brady made a picture of him, which made him look much better than he usually looked. And so he always thought that Matthew Brady had elected him president because yeah. they sent that picture out all over the place. And it made him look less like a, you know, a beastly baboon that people were making him out to be. He um, yeah, grew so a beard, all, too. So. Yeah, and, well, he grew a beard later. You know, the point is, I think that you have to credit Abraham Lincoln a lot for the emergence of Abraham yeah. Lincoln. Yeah, I mean, the most eloquent speeches that I've ever read in American 
history, although Jim told me not to use the word best because somebody will uh, come say, you know, somebody else is better. But Lincoln's right up there. But the thing about 1860s, One of the best. yeah, he One doesn't of the best. campaign. Douglas, Stephen Douglas campaigns. Lincoln doesn't campaign. He stays at home. I guess that was normal. Well, it's odd. Well, it's it's odd did. that Douglas campaigned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Douglas is that's out of that's out of the ordinary. Yeah, it was yeah. his best moment. Yes, and he's fighting secession. I mean, he was he was going to stick up for the northern democracy. Question right on the tip of my tongue, actually, Sean. When does it become evident? Both of you can answer this. That if Lincoln wins, there goes the country. We're going to see secession. Well, if you're in South Carolina, you might have thought right away. You knew right away that was what was going to happen because they've been saying that for a while. But elsewhere in the South, it's not altogether clear that that's going to happen. It's going to be a protracted, outside of the Deep South in particular, it's going to be a protracted, you know, secession's a protracted process. It's not something that yeah. happens right away. So there's contingency involved here then? There's politics involved. Politics. I mean, there's, you know, right. there's division. Lots of, lots of people are saying that. The problem is lots of Southerners are saying, we're going to leave, you know, blah, 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 you know, if, if Lincoln gets elected. <laughs> the problem is that they'd been saying this for Since so long. Since 1790. That, <laughs> you know, that it was pretty easy for Lincoln and the Republicans to sort of disregard it. You know, and and this is where those assertions that we have no intention of interfering with slavery in the states where it exists mattered importantly to them. They did not intend to abolish slavery in the states. And they kept saying, why in heaven's name are you going to leave? We're not going to abolish slavery in the states. You know, we're just not going to do it. And so there have been historians like David Potter who sort of chastise Lincoln for underestimating the seriousness of the threats of secession, stuff like that. But they had every reason to underestimate them. They had a different view of the relationship between the federal government and slavery, fundamentally different view of slavery itself, but they were not going to go into the South and start abolishing slavery. And it would have been a long slog if the South had not seceded to get slavery abolished. Fortunately, I suppose they seceded and we had a war, yeah. you know, and the war made something possible quickly that would have been much more difficult without you know, that's why we didn't mention the fourth leg of the stool Just in about the to get to that. Yes. election, which is the constitutional unionists in the upper south who are saying quite explicitly, you know, you leave the union and all bets are off. The best way to preserve slavery is to not leave the union, because if you leave the union and this Republicans were saying and they were saying you forfeit any rights you have under the Constitution to the federal protection of slavery if you leave the union and the constitutional unions took that seriously and ran with it. John uh, Bell. They were right. But John Bell, who became the nominee of the Constitutional Union Party, well, they, they're trying to do the impossible and that is shelve the slavery issue because it was so disruptive. Too late. Yeah, the Constitutional Union Party was like a good convocation of of anti-Diluvian Whigs. I mean, it was like, you know, people who were so out of, they were superannuated in many ways, yeah. politically, as well as by age, they were just old. As well as literally, yeah. Literally, They're all yeah, like, yeah. the average age is like 60. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Oh, one more like, states go. than Stephen Douglas. And they won Virginia, and I'm looking at an 1860 map, so Virginia's including uh, what would be. Become... Well, they got the border, they got yeah. some of the border states, yeah. you know, I mean, and, and that's, where, that's where you'd expect. Yeah. And Kentucky. To do, to do well. Yeah. Yeah, a total yeah. of 39 yeah. electoral votes. You look at the map here, and you can see why, one reason why Lincoln wins he wins more states than does Breckenridge in the South, but the population of the North, you have 11 electoral votes in Illinois, and then 13 in Indiana, 23 in Ohio, 27 in Pennsylvania, 35 in New York, whereas in the South, Florida has three, Carolina, I think that's South Carolina, eight, North Carolina, 10. I'm going to fail a geography quiz here while I'm speaking to you guys. Seven, nine, six, four. The, the people were in the North. I mean, we obviously know that. Those numbers are in the South are artificially boosted by the three-fifths three clause, clause as well. That's going to say. The three-fifths clause gave them more power than they would have had. However, it was not the thing that was going to keep the South in power forever because, <laughs> the, the, you know, the North grew in population by leaps and bounds. Yeah. So um, yeah. Lincoln wins uh, 1.8 million popular votes, 180 electoral votes. Breckenridge wins 72 electoral votes. Uh, Bell of the Constitutional Unionist, 39. And Stephen Douglas, poor Stephen Douglas, only 12. 
he won. He carried New Jersey. Half of it. I guess they split up their electoral votes yeah, in those yeah, days. Delaware yeah. and Missouri. Oregon and California come in on Lincoln's side. And in between the West Coast and the rest of the country, there's this big gray area. But, I mean, it's hard to overstate the importance of this. Lincoln wins, the South secedes, and, I mean, what else is there to say? I mean, it's a truly revolutionary moment. Well, the South secedes, yes. but, then, but then Lincoln, you know, Lincoln calls yeah. up 75,000 yeah. <laughs> volunteer troops after Fort Sumter. I mean, there was... He also refuses to compromise. That's well, that's the point. He goes through the that's secession the crisis absolutely. and absolutely puts his foot down, and they're not going to compromise on this fundamental question of slavery in the territories. And, you know, that, I that correct makes my... the war. Sorry to interrupt, uh, Jim. I need crucial. to correct myself there. I said the South secedes. Only some of the Southern states secede immediately. The rest, well, that's right. the rest okay. wait. Yeah, but it begins, it and, and, and 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 once Sumter happens, then you know Virginia is going to go up. But Jim's making a very important point: is that people have vastly underestimated Lincoln's anti-slavery commitment coming out of the 1860 election. There were all sorts of compromises being floated to save the Union. If the Union was the most important thing to Lincoln rather than slavery, then he would have compromised over to save the Union. But he did not. There's a famous letter he writes to Lyman Trumbull, where the, he, Trumbull's saying to him, well, there's, I was written dinner, so one of the compromises. He says, we cannot do that. We will lose our reason to exist if we did that. If the tug must come, let it come now. I mean, it's going to happen. Exactly. Let's do it. So that's really important that in the end, it was about the slavery and the territories issue and the future of slave business as well. But really, the territorial thing, I think, is what on his mind then really marks him as, as, as an anti-slavery president from the very beginning. The union was not sacrosanct in his mind. He was not going to have a union without the Republican platform that just won the, the election from being able to rule, to govern. You know, he was not going to do that. His notion of the, what the union was supposed to be was just fundamentally different, and it included the abolition of slavery. Ultimately, this is what the founders intended. The union I love and the union I'm going to fight for is a union that has put slavery on a course of ultimate extinction. In 1856, when Fremont did better than many people thought, Charles Francis Adams writes a letter, I think it's him, saying that we are on the tiptoe of revolution in 1856. And then in 1860, that's the revolution. That's what happens. And then secession, as our old colleague, our dear friend, Jim McPherson put it, that's the counter-revolution. That is reacting to the revolution that was finally completed, that had begun in 1787, I would argue, but that was finally completed in 1860 with the election of Lincoln. Ladies and gentlemen, the 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. Wait a second. I didn't know the Gettysburg Address was recorded. All right. That was Lincoln impersonator James Getty speaking at the 150th anniversary of the address at the battlefield in 2013. The battles of Gettysburg and Vicksburg, major Union victories in July 1863. but not decisive victories. By the next summer, the war seemed to be going so badly for the Union, Lincoln thought he'd lose the election in November. And if the Democrats would have prevailed, the 13th Amendment would have been a casualty of war. So 1864, uh, if you were to do a poll early in the year, uh, how popular would Abraham Lincoln have been early in 1864? Because he thinks he's going to lose at some point here, but obviously we know he wins in a landslide. Things did change quickly. But what was his popularity like in 1864? He's very popular in early 1864. And this is a case where I think the Republican Party is pretty united. You know, there's kind of an attempt, another attempt by Sam and Chase to <laughs> gather off the radicals and that that flops and things like that. It's really the injection into the Republican Party of the disagreement over Reconstruction that makes it appear that Lincoln's securing of the Republican nomination isn't as secure as it might have been because the radicals are so upset by his stance on Reconstruction. But even that, even that isn't much. It's ultimately, I mean, Lincoln says it, 
upon the progress of the war, all else depends, right? And it's what happened in Virginia. The slugfest, the brutal, bloody slugfest, protracted slugfest between Grant and Lee that produced no obvious outcome, you know, that leads to war weariness and causes Lincoln and many other Republicans to believe by the summer of 64 that he may not win re-election, right? His popularity within the Republican Party is easily enough to fend off the attempts by some radicals to displace him. His concern has to do with what the progress of the war is. You know, Sherman seems stalled in Georgia. Grant is stalled outside of Petersburg. Nothing seems to be working. That's why he believes that he might lose in November. Yes. Because of the war. Yes. So like with any war. In August. By August of 1864, it looks like that. And that's when some Republicans start floating the remarkable possibility that they replace Lincoln, who has already been nominated. Wow. Uh, and then the, the Democrats come along and they do something that shuts those Republicans up. They nominate McClellan on a pro-slavery platform. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Peace at any price. Peace platform. at any price, which is almost for slavery. That sort of reunites the Republicans around Lincoln. This is an election that matters dramatically because the consequence of this election was the fate of the 13th Amendment. The Republicans had enough votes for the first two years of the war to do anything they liked in Congress. And they did. They did lots of stuff. After the 1862 elections, the Democrats, they don't have a majority. But you need two thirds majorities to get a constitutional amendment through. So while it gets through the Senate, it does not get through the House. And if the Republicans had not re-secured super majorities in the 1864 election and Lincoln had not been reelected, which basically would have been the same thing. It's hard for me to imagine that a 13th Amendment would have been possible. This is what I think Steven Spielberg's movie on Lincoln gets right. That moment in late 1864 and early 1865, Lincoln and Seward move heaven and earth to get the lame duck Democrats who've lost their seats, you know, to change their votes. And they get that vote, knowing they had enough votes if Lincoln called the new Congress to order soon enough. But they were terribly worried that if Lee surrendered before they had that vote, the wind would go out of the sails of the 13th Amendment. Because even in late 1864, Lincoln is saying, we need the 13th Amendment to win the war, right? right? This is one of the reasons I think it's it's a mistake for historians to think that all he ever cared about was winning the war, right? That's the only reason the issue was the, the Emancipation Proclamation, because he always ties it to winning the war. But by late 1864, it was obvious that the Union was going to win the war. There was no question in anybody's mind that Grant was going to defeat Lee and, they, and they, the, the Southern armies were going to surrender. And yet Lincoln is still saying, we need this anti-slavery yeah. amendment yep. in order to win the war, right? That, to me, is the proof that the win the war argument is pragmatic, not necessarily his motivation. His real yeah. self. So there is war weariness, but as you say, by late in the year, it's pretty clear the Union has a decisive advantage. But still, it's not clear how much longer the fighting is going to go on. And casualties were appalling in 1864. But like in any country that's in a prolonged war, uh, there's war weariness and wars can become unpopular for that reason. But then there's the question of, well, what do we do about it? Uh, Do we want to just sue for peace? Do we want to give up after everything we've sacrificed? Clearly, that was what some Democrats were pushing, right? There was a peace plank in the Democrats, the northern, we're only talking about the northern part of the country, obviously. McClellan was not a a peace guy, but there was a plank in the party's platform calling (laughs) for peace. We talked about the divisions in the Democrats in 1860. What were the divisions among Democrats in 1864 and why were they important? Well, traditionally, it's described as the difference between peace Democrats and war Democrats. And McClellan is a war Democrat, but the peace Democrats had enough votes to push their own platform through the convention. Right. So there's that division. And it's significant. It's a significant division. What did they Uh, want? Did they want the war to simply end and preserve slavery where, you know, or not end slavery? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The union as it was. The union as it was. Yeah. The union as it was. The Constitution as it is and the union as it was. That's their slogan. Right. They don't want to change the Constitution. They don't want a 13th Amendment. and And they want the union restored. And they think foolishly, I think, that if they offered peace 
with slavery to the southern states that the southern states would come back. And I think that's that was naive. But if McClellan had won and the Republicans did not get that two-thirds vote, there would have been no push to get the 13th Amendment through. The South would have been defeated. It would have surrendered. But it would have been able to keep slavery mm -hmm. because McClellan wasn't going to require that. There would be no 13th Amendment. Can we be so sure that so, McClellan yep. would have prosecuted the war all the way to the end? Oh, yeah. He was he was absolutely. a unionist. Okay. Oh, absolutely. He was a unionist yeah. and he was he was not a traitor. He wanted no. this. He wanted the North to win. Yeah. And it was going to win. The North was going to win. He wasn't going to pull Grant back and things like that. You know, but just uh, remember, that, just remember that what happened in Atlanta mattered a lot. This bloody struggle in Virginia was effaced to a certain degree by Sherman's victory in, in Atlanta. I mean, that's what really turns things around, I think, in terms of Lincoln's right. prospects. I mean, uh, before Atlanta. Yeah. OK. Things are looking gloomy. After Atlanta, I think that's the moment when it became clear we we're going to win. We, the North, the Union was going to win the war. As, as Jim said before, I mean, everything depends on the progress of our arms. And what happened there was, was crucial. I think that's important because the war weariness is there in August. But by the fall, it's no longer there. Yeah, it's yeah. not. Sherman's is the big deal. But Sheridan's. Uh, yeah, the valley. victories yeah. in the in the Shenandoah Valley. Mm -hmm. It's the securing of Mobile Bay. You know, these are three big wins right. for the Union that happened before the November elections and that make Northerners say, you know, we're not going to give up. The tide of feeling in the North turns dramatically. You know, they could taste victory and they reelect Lincoln and give the Republicans the supermajorities they need. The military historian Cathal Nolan has argued that there are no decisive battles in modern wars of attrition. So you look at 1863, Gettysburg and Vicksburg, of course they were important, but then we're into 1864 and before these key Union wins, it's not clear what's going to happen or how long the war is going to last, right? Gettysburg yeah. was important, right. but it wasn't decisive. So how— Well, it couldn't be. Decisive in the sense that you've completely and sufficiently destroyed the It'll enemy's capacity to fight. Right. That doesn't happen. Yeah. But it, for one thing, there are just too many southern armies and northern armies all around the south so that yeah. a, a, a decisive defeat one place doesn't mean defeat. I mean, after all, Sherman wins Atlanta, but— John Bell Hood carries his army up into Tennessee. If there's decisive battles, it's the battles that he fights in, mm. in Franklin and Nashville. Mm -hmm. Those battles do, I would say, decisively destroy that army. Yeah, Lincoln that, has better that, generals at this point, right? Oh, yes. Uh, well, point, McClellan the was three terrible. best generals in the war are Grant. Sherman and Sheridan are the three best generals, and they're all brought east. All brought east. Yeah. You know, I listened to James McPherson give a talk once in, in a park in New York City where he, he tried to explain what was wrong with McClellan. You know, when it came down to decision time, he just lacked the moral courage to put his men in harm's way. Sean, how controversial were Lincoln's wartime restrictions on civil liberties? Well, I mean, I mean, they're controversial it, it, today with neo Confederates. Yeah, I think they're probably more controversial today than they were then, actually. I mean, because we were fighting a war after all, and uh, the Copperheads were Copperheads. No, I look, it gave a certain degree of what, what shall we say, fuel, propaganda value. Um, you had guys like Vallingham giving their speeches in the middle of, you know, Ohio towns and, and rabble rousing and so forth. But no, I don't think that there was a great you and cry against Lincoln at the time, except by those people who were, you know, saying that he was a tyrant. And, and you know, it's become a kind of an argument about him on the right, about Lincoln, that he was a state mongering tyrant. You know, you can see all of that from the habeas corpus suspensions and all the rest of it. That wasn't what was what was hurting Lincoln so much as the, you know, the fact that the war was not going terribly well. Let me back up a little bit. I mean, there was this fifth column. And you, when you have, you know, like things like the draft riots when they happen, the attempts to try to blow New York City up because New York City was going to be the hotbed of, you know, northern support for the South. This is there. It's it's a problem. So Lincoln had something, really had to deal with something. It's not as if these things were, were irrelevant. Yeah. Confederate but, newspapers were trying to get people to resist the draft, right? Well, that, but also, I mean, you had basically Confederate papers being published by the northerners. I mean, it was, it was not That's good. Meant, yeah. And look, Lincoln did an amazing thing, right? He did not shut down the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was allowed to exist. You know, how many times are you in a revolutionary situation in modern times when one party will allow an opposing party to exist in wartime? So the idea of Lincoln as a tyrant is insane to me. There were no elections in the South, but the North had elections. 
and he could have lost. He was willing to go that far. But by the same token, these other people were an irritant. They were a problem behind the lines. So I don't get the impression that there was a great deal of, you know, uh, what should we say, quailing or pearl clutching over what Lincoln was doing in terms of civil rights in the North. I think it's a big deal for that peace wing of the Democratic Party. Yes, oh, right? absolutely. And it's, in, and it's in the 1864 platform. Sure. But the point I made earlier about how all those old issues of tariffs and and Homestead became assimilated into the anti-slavery, the issue of Lincoln being a tyrant becomes assimilated in 1864 into the peace Democrat. Like, you're willing to destroy the rights of white people in order to free black people. Yeah, right, right, right. 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 So the pro-slavery aspect of the Peace Democrats is inseparable from the way they use the argument about civil liberties. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, my sense is that most modern historians agree that Lincoln went too far in the suppression of civil liberties, but not so far that he turned the country into this authoritarian tyranny or fascist yeah. state or like yeah. that. You know, after 9-11, 9-11 happened on election day, and Rudy Giuliani says, let's cancel the elections. Keep me mayor, right? right. That's the way authoritarians <laughs> think. Lincoln doesn't even contemplate that for a moment. It's, no. it's just not there. So before we get to the the results here, just a couple of other items, some really interesting things or crazy things about this campaign. Democrats were denying that slavery was the cause of the war. I'm getting this from a book written by one Jay Oaks, Freedom National, page 471 and 472. Also, the racial demagoguery uh, I'd like to talk about, the way the campaign was conducted was vicious. There's an illustration in those days that if you get another four years of Lincoln, the miscegenation ball, am I pronouncing that right? You're going to have blacks and whites intermingling with each other. Uh, That's where the word comes from. That's where the word comes from, right. Which word invented is that? in 1864. Oh, miscegenation. Wow. Didn't exist before yeah. that. No. It was in a pamphlet, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, it, with a big exclamation point. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Well, why did right. the, That's where the word comes I from. mean, maybe the obvious answer is they did this because that this is how they felt about black people, but why did the Democrats take this tactic to try to defeat Lincoln? This started in the 1850s. This is Stephen Douglas, right? Yeah. The Democrats cannot take a pro-slavery position. Right. But they don't want to take an anti-slavery position. So they try to shift the debate to race. Right. You know, it's not about it's not about slavery. It's about race. I think it's worth pointing out that was Douglas's position and the Democratic Party's position in 1860. And they lost. And it was the Democratic Party's position in 1864. And they lost. And it was the Democratic Party's position in 1868. And they lost. We have a series of elections in which the main point made by the opposition is demagogic racism and they lost. I'm not saying all Republicans were, you know, Martin Luther King's in waiting (laughs) and stuff like that. I know what you're getting at. But the race baiting doesn't always work. It's not all about white supremacy all the time. Well, white supremacy loses. It's a losing issue with the majority of white men in, in the North. And Lincoln wins in a landslide. Lincoln, 212 electoral votes, 2.2 million popular votes. McClellan, 21 electoral votes, 1.8 million popular votes. When did McClellan win? Just out of curiosity. Oh, let, me, let me find the map. Did he win in New Jersey? Because he had Jersey He did. He did. Come yeah, on, Will Lance. What's going on with your home uh, state? You know, I moved here later, <laughs> much later than that. I, I didn't, you know. Yeah, he I wins mean, uh, Delaware, Jersey, and Kentucky. Lincoln sweeps everything else, including the new state of Nevada. There are two very important things that matter to me when I talk about the Civil War to people. And one is that anti-slavery politics caused the Civil War, right? So we don't start from zero anti-slavery when the war starts and get to anti-slavery. It starts with an anti-slavery impetus that's already there. And second, the war radicalizes that impulse in dramatic ways. It makes more and more people more and more determined that this war should not end without ending the cause of the war, right? right? And so the 13th Amendment is the end product of a radicalization process that takes place over the course of the war among Northerners. And that's why the 1864 election is so important, because it it is the completion of that radicalization process. Without it, there is no 13th Amendment. Right. Right. I'm absolutely certain about that. No question in my mind, Abraham Lincoln's the greatest president we've ever had. There you go again. <laughs> 
I don't object to that statement. This may be the one thing we're going to let you get away with, Carol. He was, he was, certainly, he was certainly a great president. You know, Jim, uh, Sean has written articles about best and worst presidents. Yeah, I know, but I get paid for them. I think after George W. Bush's presidency was over, you wrote a piece. No, it was very much still going. I wrote a piece for Rolling Stone magazine That's right. called The Worst President in History, yeah. question mark. I think you've since well, amended that. I, no, no, I had a question mark, and I, question and mark, I kept yeah. it as a question mark. Like, I didn't want to say it was lots of bad presidents. Um, That's right. But, you know, the point was I wrote that piece when Bush was still kind of, what should we say, um, the, his popularity polls were still very high. They were very high after after 9-11, and they continued to be high for a very long time, and they got him through the election. But it was just after the election that I wrote that piece. No, I guess it was just when Katrina had happened. No one was saying this, that he was a bad president in the mainstream media. People were saying it sort of voce. So I, got, I took the opportunity to make his bold statement. And his numbers went, you know, continued to go down after that, obviously. Yeah. Well, you know, when it comes to comparing presidents or athletes across eras, it's hard to do. I think the best way to compare Lincoln is to compare him to his immediate predecessors, who had the same issues and the same opportunities to deal with the problems. He was preceded by three of the worst presidents in American history. Mildred Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, and James Buchanan. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we return to the Middle East and another word that we've been hearing at those campus protests, Intifada. We're going to explore the history of the first and second Intifada, 1987 and then again in 2000, as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. 